You are strong, confident, and powerful, and you can do anything you want to do. You can shatter glass ceilings and pave the way for opportunities that show off your talent and unique skills. At LEAD, we believe in you. We believe in diversity, youth, women, and minorities. We believe in female leadership, empowerment, and employability for youth, women, and minorities. We encourage policy dialogue and institutional strengthening to build more robust and more sustainable socioeconomic structures. We enable private sector institutions to hire the talents of tomorrow to fight the causes of migration and create local prosperity. Our organization is set up to empower and support you in challenging the status quo by creating multiple Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very honored to have you here joining our first uh, Digital Saloon for LEAD initiative. <clears throat> Thank you everyone who is joining us over Facebook as well as our partner organizations from the Middle East, North Africa region. Um, uh, it escapes no one that um, the, the internet and the advent of internet and digital technologies has revolutionized um, the way things are done across different sectors and in some instances um, even changing the rules altogether. And the feminist movement is uh, no exception to this revolution. Um, since the advent of the internet and social media and networking sites, um, the feminist movement has taken um, the digital sphere and um, portrayed feminist activism and discussion. Um, such activism has taken several forms, such as um, advocacy, awareness raising, um, lobbying, mass mobilization, and such. Um, I think uh, the, digital, the digital sphere and movement uh, can, be, can be of profound help. Um, and this is in the sense that it has provided an avenue for um, girls and women from different parts of the world and in, from different backgrounds to um, voice their opinions who are usually misrepresented, um, marginalized, or not heard. Um, so it allowed them a space where they can reclaim uh, the, the digital sphere, speak, voice their opinions about their issues, and engage in discussions with policymakers and decision makers in a true portrayal and demonstration of a, bo a bottom-up approach. Um, now, one such example of the success is the Me Too movement, the very popular Me Too movement, which is a social media phenomenon that shed light on the sexual abuse and uh, misconduct that women are subjected to across all sectors, including the humanitarian aid sector. Um, the feminist movement uh, changed the way things are done. It allowed women to speak up about uh, the sexual abuse and misconduct that they face in the workplace, at home, or on the street, and um, enabled them to speak out and uh, seek legal actions. Um, and also Also, again, this has changed the way we view sexual abuse, uh, but actually it appears that it happens to all women, hence the name Me Too. Um, now, this is, uh, all of these avenues are great that the digital sphere presents, but however, we, it's important not to view it as the panacea or the ultimate solution for gender equality, uh, because akin to the real world, um, the digital sphere or the digital world comes with its own host of challenges and problems that uh, we as feminists need to engage with, critique, and find ways to um, navigate around and um, uh, solve them so as they do not hinder the progression of the feminist movement. Um, today, we will attempt to discuss these challenges and problems as well as shedding light on the positive aspects and the positive stories uh, that the uh, digital sphere affords the uh, the digital sphere affords the feminist movement. Um, uh, today, uh, I am honored to present to you Shema Bouhlal, the moderator for our event. Um, Shema is an independent consul consultant based in uh, Tunisia. Uh, and over the past few years, her work has focused on decentralization reforms that are taking place in Tunisia since the changing of the Tunisian constitution in 2014, uh, as well as uh, issues of citizen participation, transparency, and good governance. Um, uh, Shema is also involved in the media scene in Tunisia, uh, where she contributed to two different radio shows. Um, 
and is currently a collabor collaborator on a bi-weekly TV show that is related to current affairs, public policy, and politics. Uh, Shema holds a bachelor deg degree in molecular biology and cellular biology, uh, and a secondary in government from the University of Harvard. I am very honored to present to you Shema Bohlad. Shema, over to you. Thank you, Renza. The honor is mine. Uh, when we focus on digital advancements, we are often under the impression that humanity is advancing at an incredible rate um, and finding solutions. But when we take a look around, uh, the harsh reality hits us back and uh, we realize that there are still groups that are um, suffering from archaic forms of discrimination and violence. This is why I want to thank the lead initiative team for this excellent preparation for this uh, saloon and for insisting on discussing pressing issues despite the turmoils that are taking place around the world and uh, among which in Tunisia and providing a really safe and accessible space for sharing what digital solutions can look like as a form of, of hope for change. Uh, although I wish that this was um, an event that was taking place in person, I am really grateful um, that my guests are here, uh, grateful that technology is, so, is, for, is, uh, is posing as a form of resistant, uh, resistance in times of, of restricted social um, uh, movement and uh, barriers. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome the audience who are tuning in with us to follow the feminist movements in the time of digitalization, the first saloon among many yet to come. Um, then I'd like to stress, to stress what a pleasure it is and an honor to be moderating a discussion in the presence of three powerful women of which I know personally but I look forward for the audience to also know them and see how amazing they are in the fields that they are doing and to hear more about the fights that they are um, and the combats that they are carrying every day to make women's lives better but also humans um, in general, each in their own environment and their own way. I'd like to uh, welcome Rita Anani, who's the co-founder of Abad. She joins us from Lebanon. Welcome, Rita. I'd like to uh, welcome Ines Hamdi, uh, who's joining us from Egypt. She's the co-founder of Harass Map and uh, RES Solutions. And I'd like to welcome Sonia bin Miled, who's joining from uh, Tunisia. She's a member of Aswat Nise and one of the co-founders of uh, NZ. Uh, this discussion will go as follows. Each speaker will have five minutes each to tell us what experience she brings with us today and what she would like to virtually share with us. Uh, I will then be rebounding with uh, questions to highlight furthermore the points or the work that they would like to share. Throughout the conversation, and actually starting now, the audience is um, uh, welcome to share comments or questions in the comment uh, section uh, in, the, in the live uh, event. My awesome colleague, Sosan, will be collecting the questions and sharing them with me, and I will make sure that I will take every possible opportunity to pose the questions to appropriate guests if they're specific or in general. This discussion is limited to one hour only, uh, and the timer, uh, I will be holding a timer, not to be uh, restrictive, but to try to be um, uh, fair. Uh, if we do not push for equality in time, how can we preach about equality in general? In terms of, um, of order, so this was a tricky question for me. Uh, I tried to have some kind of temporal or uh, news-related relevance. I was torn between starting with Rita, uh, with uh, Lebanon commemorating one year since the disaster of the Beirut port. Um, and I know that she has a lot to say about urban planning and how safe it is for women. But I also thought about Sunia bin Miled, um, who uh, will tell us more about how a suspended member of parliament actually inspired the movement um, in Tunisia. I did choose to start with Rida in order to uh, be impartial, given that I'm Tunisian, and then I will geographically move to Tunisia. So we will start with Rida from Lebanon, and then Ines from Egypt, and then Sunia from Tunisia. Rida, the floor is yours, and you have five Thank minutes. You. Thank you so much, uh, Shaima, and thank you, Renda, also for the uh, for engaging me in this very interesting discussion and uh, salon, and actually having a currently like a window to uh, to share what's going on in Lebanon with the with the with the sudden collapse of the entire state, if I can say, and with the tragic incident that we were commemorating um, uh, yesterday. In addition to all the layers of complexity of the system that. I would, I would definitely say women and girls are mostly uh, the one targeted and affected uh, by going from the already the patriarchy and the corrupted system to all the discriminatory legislative 
frameworks. Adding to that was the economic crisis, uh, and we know very well its association with the increase of vulnerability and possible risk of being abused and exploited. And that was topped up by the global pandemic. Uh, Lebanon uh, has uh, had its part as well. And going by the Beirut port uh, blast, uh, the, 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 the real uh, collective trauma that we all uh, struggled from, and so on and so forth. So really, thank you, Randa. Uh, and I know that uh, even the organizers have, uh, have been a little bit patient as well in the communication uh, in, in organizing this, uh, taking into account uh, all what's going on. So thank you for that. I'll try to uh, limit, I think uh, already I lost one minute, uh, uh, just to, to share uh, with you all uh, like really some of the thoughts and the thinking and learning from, from Lebanon on when it comes to the intersectionality between the use of digital world and uh, our work and activism on uh, and especially I would say uh, the core mandate and the focus and the niche of Abad uh, in Lebanon was uh, combating all forms of gender-based violence and specifically uh, sexual uh, sexual violence uh, toward, uh, toward women and girls. To start with, it's important to reiterate the, the main function of the, the use of digital activism when it, and when it comes to uh, promoting and advancing the gender equality agenda or addressing inequalities. First, it's a, it's a great medium to communicate and promote uh, availability of services, meaning that it's, it, it, it contributes uh, a lot in enhancing the accessibility of those affected uh, to services by promoting helpline or availability of services and so on and so forth. Secondly, it has been extensively used and especially at exceptional moments and in specific areas to report violation. And that was as well something that uh, as activists we took forward with companies like Facebook and Instagram because women and girls were really um, very recurrently using these platforms to be able to seek help or send a message flagging a life-threatening situation. Third, it has a function, main func function in creating a public opinion because it can help a lot in lobbying, mobilizing, uh, putting pressure on a certain cause. Uh, and that is especially in cases where we need to name and shame or like, you know, to highlight widely on an issue and then push stakeholders for a, for a reform or arrest a perpetrator or so on and so forth. It has an important uh, role in nudging, and that is very important for those working in that kind of activism, because sometimes you can do the nudging through digital platform to start a conversation around a topic, grab attention, and then pick on uh, the, the main issue. Like, the, let's say, the Global Shame uh, uh, Me Too campaign where we picked on it in Lebanon, Shame on Who, for instance, that helped us in, in, in really working on the victim blaming uh, culture. The nudging was in opening the debate around uh, who is to blame uh, when, when there's an incident of rape. The major focus was we want to reform the legislation, we want to abolish Article 522 in, in relation to uh, uh, having the rapist escape the punishment in case he marries the victim, but also what we want is actually to break the taboo and to break the, 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 the victim blame lens that is even if we have a legislative reform, it can continue to happen. Of course, advocacy and lastly, the awareness on when it comes to misconceptions. But having said that, we need to know that nowadays, even the, the digital uh, platforms are being heavily uh, referential on when it comes to gender socialization per se. In the past, it used to be like, we take the understanding of gender role and what is okay and what is not okay, basically from school, house, uh, the, the, the educational system and the traditional media. Today, the social media is the main uh, tool for socialization. But having said that, we need to remember, yeah, I'm going to uh, try to wrap up and then add, there are multiple points afterward. The do no harm principle. It's very important if you're using that for f feminist activism, we need to always remember that we have the victims themselves being exposed to the content. We need to ensure integrity and no contradiction. Not today I talk about like, you know, 
uh, bad mouth perpetrate, perpetrators and then the second day I want to call upon men to come and partner with me and the power of data and accuracy of data is super super important and inclusivity there are a couple of points Shaima maybe in the question and answer rounds I will I will add yes. them for, for the learning okay excellent yeah. thank you Rida and it's always excellent to uh, to uh, end on a note that is uh, more focused on um, our principles and the values that our work is driven by I'll go to Ines now uh, from Egypt Ines the floor is yours you have six minutes uh, since I gave Rida six minutes um, thing now uh, thank you uh, for everyone and thank you for inviting me to participate in this interesting salon. Uh, first, I want to share my screen uh, until uh, the screen is ready. Uh, I am focusing today on giving an overview about the situation in Egypt uh, and also uh, I thought it's important to, um, uh, to present the, the definitions and concepts just because it's, it's important to, to have all people on the same page regarding what women has experienced online. <clears throat> so, um, should I <laughs> present my... Um, I need the screen right now. You can go ahead, Ines, and once the screen is ready... Okay. You know, in in Parliament in Tunisia, when this happens, they usually claim that the time should not be counted, the time that was wasted. And it's probably the only place in, in, in government where time actually matters. So I will not count this time, and I'll give you back your minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. I, I lost the... I can't start with my own presentation. Okay. So women... Uh, Nearly three out of four women globally have experienced so, some forms of online violence, and online violence can take range of behaviors such as cyberbullying, cyber harassment, uh, um, phishing, um, stalking, and also hacking. So, um, due to um, the, the huge use of digital technology, we can find violence in social media applications such as Facebook, Instagram, also in dating apps, through emails and, all, and online forums and chat rooms. Uh, when it comes to cybersexual harassment, the definition of cybersexual harassment it can be any form of unwanted sexual conduct or action uh, that happen on digital platforms that make a person feel uncomfortable uh, and the action violate his or her personal privacy and also, uh, it's called uh, make the person feel it's it's uh, it's hard or it's not easy to, uh, to congest. Uh, so, in order to consider a, an action like a sexual harassment action, there are four main conditions: it's violate the personal space, it cause harm, and it's for sure it's unwanted action and with a sexual nature. When it comes to cyber sexual harassment forms, we can find it's it's. A, it can be uh, receiving unwanted sexual content such as messages or videos or text. It can be uh, non-consensual pornography when someone uh, per, uh, images or videos has been taken and shared on, online without their consent. It can also be sort of sex extortion or uh, threaten someone to, to send more explicit or uh, sexually images. Um, and if this person doesn't respond to the, the offender, the, the pictures can go uh, online. And also another type is called unwanted sexual solicitation when um, first there are many requests to, uh, uh, to send sexual images or answering sexual questions. When it comes to cyberbullying, cyberbullying is similarly to, uh, to bullying, but with using digital technology in order to make the person feel uh, shaming or hunger uh, or anger or, uh, or, uh, or scaring. 
uh, some forms of uh, cyberbullying can be sending or posting uh, uh, negative um, harmful messages or um, uh, uh, in person photos of someone on social media, hate speeches. Um, looking at what happening in Egypt right now, uh, the prevalence of cybersexual harassment is coming. For example, according to studies uh, conducted by Harassment in 2019, we found that only 75% of, per, uh, of women we have uh, interviewed has already experienced at least one form of cybersexual uh, harassment. On another study, uh, there are 37% experience non-consensual pornography and 17% receive the threats uh, to, to share their personal pictures without their consent or not. So this is, you know, um, this is not only what happened in Egypt, but there are more common tra allergic trends. For example, taking pictures and recording videos for women in public places. And recently there was an incident when a woman walking in the airport and the officer in the airport recorded a picture, uh, a video for her without her consent. And also another example for uh, alerting the trans uh, intimate image and videos abuse. For example, an expert can uh, share uh, his, uh, his wife images for regulation. Um, and of course, using sexual comments and words, it's commonly happened. Uh, so we can find uh, women uh, near the pitch or slut or whore because of their physical appearance on social media. The last type is state cyber violence. Uh, nowadays, uh, state uh, targeting women on uh, social media application for for unknown reason and for unknown reason. Um, by looking at the effort that people um, doing on the ground to um, to confront cyber harassment, we can easily recognize feminist movement's efforts. For example, Harassmap, in since 10 years and more, Harassmap started using digital tools to, to encourage people to report and uh, destroy and bring the, the taboo about the issue of sexual harassment. And also, Harassmap continued to raise awareness about the issue of sexual harassment in general, plus cyber sexual harassment. And for example, we, we did a campaign on, uh, uh, on cyber sexual harassment and what it, what it means and how people can protect their privacy on, um, on social media and what they can do if they experience any type of cyber sexual harassment. Another movement, uh, for example, the uh, assault police, speak up, cut of calls, Cairo, they already doing great work on the ground. Uh, especially they are working on encouraging women to share what they are experiencing and people already take the initiative and they start sending them uh, the messages not only on psychosexual harassment and sexual harassment but on different forms of violence against women and based on the, what they are receiving uh, uh, a formal action has been taken and many cases went to jail because of their effort of shaming the harassers and start sharing the testimonies of people with, with their consent. Uh, this is how they can build the movement in order to, to, uh, to encourage girls to speak about uh, what they are experiencing and also make the state accountable for putting measurements to, uh, to deal accurately with uh, uh, cyber sexual harassment. Yes, um, we can definitely go deeper in that in the follow-up question. Um, uh, if you don't mind, now we're going to move to Sunya so she can tell us more, and then we can rebound. If there's anything that you would like to expand more, you definitely have more time. Oh. Um, and it's interesting to see how social media can be used as both a weapon and um, a form of change. Uh, on that note, Sunya uh, from Tunis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Shaima. Uh, and thank you uh, to the LEAD Initiative for this uh, invitation. Uh, it's very nice to virtually meet all of you. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, perfect. So, uh, as you were saying, Shaima, in the beginning, um, 
following everything that's been going on in Tunisia and following the decision uh, to lift the immunity uh, of the members of the parliament, we, mm -hmm. as what we say, wanted to remind the president of the case of the MP Zuhair Makhlouf, uh, who is accused of sexual harassment and whose trial is pending still uh, st since uh, 2019. Uh, so um, this case actually started the uh, Enazeda movement in Tunisia. It started with, uh, with pictures being um, shared online and it kind of went viral everything everyone was was talking about it and um it, it involved a high school uh, student a senior in high school and we reached out to her and we tried to help her as much as we could with a lawyer and everything and we noticed that uh, people started to share their own testimonies on social media mostly on twitter and uh the nz movement the me too uh, the the Tunisian Me Too, let's say, uh, started then and there uh, in October 2019. Uh, so it was all very spontaneous. People shared their stories of sexual harassment. Uh, and um, that's when we also decided that we needed to create a support group for, for this young girl so she doesn't feel alone. So that's why we decided to do that on Facebook, which is kind of the most used social media in Tunisia. Uh, when we launched the group, uh, we honestly, we did not think that we, it would have this impact. Uh, I mean, it was a support group for her so she doesn't feel alone, as I was saying. And um, in the in the first few hours, uh, we received many testimonies. I mean, um, it was kind of overwhelming in the first few days. We kind of had to take um, a step back to take a little break in order to kind of reorganize ourselves uh, because we we I mean we launched that uh, group which is which is a private group and we tried and we we still are trying to make it as safe as possible even though we know that um, it cannot really be a safe space. Uh, I mean, in the virtual world, but we're trying. Uh, so that's why we have several moderators and we are several administrators. Uh, and that's why we decided to, um, anyone who wanted to be part of the group needed to uh, answer questions and uh, needed to read, carefully read uh, the, the group's rules and uh, respect them, of course, uh, and kind of abide by them. <laughs> so uh, one of the rules was uh, like, uh, kind of like uh, Rida said, uh, to not blame people, to not uh, to not put the blame on the victims, because we we kind of still have that um, that reflex in, in anywhere around, around the world actually, and not leave judgy comments, because all that you can do here is kind of support the the victims, and even like. Uh, a little, I mean, something like a good. A good uh, I hope you're doing well, and, and uh, it's 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 a very brave of you to speak out. It's very important because here the Enazida movement uh, goal is to help break the code of silence surrounding uh, the surrounding the taboo of sexual violence. Uh, so um, when we saw that on social media right now uh, on the Enazida, we have over forty thousand. Sonia, we lost your voice. Oh, um, sorry. You're giving voice to victims, but we lost yours. Okay, it's back. <laughs> it's back. Perfect. So yeah, uh, as I was saying, uh, the NSA's goal is to help break uh, the code of silence around, surrounding sexual violence, the, the taboo of sexual violence in Tunisia. So uh, when we saw all that, we also noticed that there was a lack of knowledge regarding uh, Law 58, combating, uh, combating violence against women in Tunisia. So it was very important for us to spread awareness uh, about that law in order for people to know and in order for victims to know what to do when they are uh, uh, subject to that kind of violence. Uh, either it is cyber violence, like Ines was saying, or uh, sexual violence or anything, so on, uh, anything uh, regarding violence. And um, we also did uh, group therapy with, a psycholo with psychologists for people who wanted to be part of that. But as time went on, we noticed that we needed to be, um, let's say, to be more proactive and to help them even more because uh, victims were reaching out. I mean, we were we were having we were receiving hundreds of testimonies uh, with over forty thousand of people on the group. So we needed to help them even more, and it kind of uh, it kind of leaves you with um, a feeling of frustration when you can when you cannot help them. So that's why we decided to launch um, a system. Uh, it's a legal uh, and a psychological orientation for victims of violence. So we have a number 
number uh, on which they can reach out to us and uh, they can book a consultation with, uh, with a psychologist and, and a lawyer and we try to help them as much as we can, of course, and uh, we have several uh, victims who actually uh, reached out to us. We have over 90 person who actually reached out to us, which is um, quite important for us. Uh, we, we are seeing that, um, I mean, it takes a lot of time we, we all know that it, it's going to take a lot of time when we remember that the case of Zuhair Makhlouk has been pending for uh, over two years now. So, but, but we're doing what we can do, let's say. And we hope that things, uh, that the law, the law 58 will be uh, implemented uh, even more efficiently in Tunisia. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, we'll get back to the, the irony of having a parliament that legislates for good uh, laws, but also has members who are not obviously abiding by them. But I will go back to Lebanon and we'll go back to Rita and um, you, you will have space to continue your thoughts. But I will ask a question um, that you can feel free to also respond to. How can you in Lebanon or in other places in the world put or set uh, the, the agenda that combats violence against women in all its forms, um, uh, and how can it compete with other agendas that are social and that are political, and especially in countries that are facing failure of a state or of an economy? So feel free to respond to this whenever you'd like, but also feel free to have um, your time to talk about other things. You have six minutes starting now. Just make sure that your microphone is on so we can hear you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Shaima. I think it's a very important question because it's always our daily, uh, let's say, strategic thinking on how to keep the issues of women protection or ending gender-based violence uh, uh, as a priority and in the forefront uh, amidst everything else that is happening. And that's why it's very important, the notion of adapting. So. You, you not like really bringing the issue as if out of the blue to the reality because by the end of the day uh, the issues of inequalities or gender-based violence is very much it's it's one of the major public health issues and it's intersecting with all other agendas by the end of the day so when we wanted to keep the discussion around the importance of women protection or ending gender-based violence um, when the, the revolution started even, linking that to, okay, so we are contributing to uh, being in the forefront. We had the campaign on safety for safe, uh, safety keeper, for safe keepers. Um, we're like contributing to this and to that and to the relief and we're in the in demonstrations, but though, despite all that, we're doing this le leading role, despite all that, we don't feel safe. So linking the the um, the messaging and linking the slogan to uh, adapting to the global context is very important to avoid any kind of resistance to what we're trying to say and we have seen this in so some campaigns where um everything was collapsing let's say and now we're calling upon um let's say one example was lifting the age of marriage so talking about child marriage or raising the age at a time where you have economic problems uh, you have political vacuum, you're in the middle of the pandemic, you have the explosion and all of that. Um, talking as if it's the straightforward way on like the, uh, our right is to raise the age or talking about sexual harassment without linking it to the reality, it might create a backfire and a, a counter effect, I would have to say, to what you're trying to do and it might harm the cause. Hence, I, I wanted just to flag some of the, um, let's say, uh, inconvenience and this inconvenience of having the uh, offline and online activism. One of those is like uh, the issue of reach and engagement. Of course, online, when you're doing the using as well digital platforms, the reach and the spread of what you're trying to communicate and the cause is larger than the offline. However, you might lose if you don't strategize well the human face of the story. <clears throat> because the digital activism uh, can prohibit uh, the angle of like really having the people concerned, the right holders themselves con that, that they are concerned to be in the heart of what we're doing and hence the ownership. And that is one of the mis yani disadvantages if we, we don't play it <clears throat> uh, in a wise way. Uh, because uh, you might lose the ownership. So doing it in the digital 
meaning that we need to keep in mind the human element to have the voice of the right holders to have the uh, ensuring that you're asking the audience to engage with you otherwise it's simply receptive it might be raising awareness but not really a kind of activism uh, in sense of mobilization and of course the the notion of um, um, the, the the issue of control and cost <clears throat> the control in sense uh, uh, in the online if it's the steps are not uh, studied very wisely and you're calculating every word and also taking into account all the principles that you're saying the feminist language the dumohan principle like really making into account that everyone might be exposed to this sometimes if it lose its track and you have an attack of course the margin of control in putting back things in the right track and really rebringing the discussion to what you are uh, doing advocacy around there is a kind of risk over there if it's not there you don't have a communication strategy and you're ready for everything of course the offline you are doing a demonstration you're doing one off activity it's uh, you have building blocks you have time to control and fix and re restore let's say uh, the campaign on track while online if it goes out and there is a kind of attack or criticism or the conversation is, is taken and, and somewhere else uh, it's a kind of risky uh, for a woman lastly i just wanted also to keep in uh, to, to to for us as, as also human rights activists in addition to being of course feminist activists is the importance of not calling for a right while we are violating another one and that's one of the key things in the in the issue of digital campaigning versus uh, feminist activism so for instance not leaving any anyone behind there is the the notion of inclusivity so sometimes there is a limitation in accessibility to these tech platforms for let's say uh, refugees migrants like uh, minority groups that they cannot ha they cannot control even the, the the their mobile phone it's shared with all members of the family uh, the cost is one barrier the language is one barrier and you cannot do everything in arabic english french on all uh, platforms and they don't have access to that internet is costly but also in lebanon for instance there is this issue of safety of the data so uh, sometimes the reporting or you have the activists themselves what is being transferred through digital platforms even if they're sending their document because they are raped or whatsoever via whatsapp via facebook via instagram via different platforms the data is not saved it's it's controlled or like uh, the government can access to that so the issue of data safety protocols is also one of the things is very important to keep in mind in in addition to how much we can be inclusive to all uh, to women from all uh, backgrounds Thank you, Rida, and maybe we will have at the end more time to even think about ways moving forward to make a safer place online and offline. So please, if you still have more ideas that you'd like to share, we do have a third round of um, of, uh, of, of speaking. Um, I will move to Ines, and I have some questions. Um, thank you, Sous, and the questions from Miranda. I will ask you, Ines, one of the questions, which is, uh, which Rima talked about uh, a little, which is integrating um, the online and offline work. Uh, I know we cut uh, we cut your presentation, um, um, and you can you can fair, feel free to, to continue. Perhaps that will answer this question, but it's an important question I think to tackle. So you have six minutes um, uh, to reflect on that or anything you'd like. Uh, okay, so it's important, Yeni, as you mentioned, it's important to manage between online and offline work in order to encompass different forms of violence against women. So, for example, in you know, a feminist movement in Egypt, the, nowadays they are mainly using uh, social media to, to work on, uh, uh, on raising the awareness about cybersexual harassment and other forms of uh, online violence. On the same time, the, the National Council for Women, for example, start taking initiatives to offer supporting reporting channels for survivors uh, of uh, different forms of violence. They offer them with hotline and WhatsApp number to report, uh, and also they uh, they start working on initiating uh, the law for um, uh, guarantee the safety of witnessing and uh, the reporters of different forms of violence crimes. In, in addition to that, uh, NGOs are starting working on using available resources uh, to raise awareness on different issues related to, to violence, starting from 
the definition and different forms of it, and also uh, offering people with the, the knowledge on digital safety and how the people can guarantee their safety online. For example, uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, posted a guideline uh, or a toolkit for people to, to use. And for example, it, it tells people what they can do if they are experienced um, a threat online and to share their personal uh, images or videos. So they develop, for example, uh, as, in six R rules. In, it's, it's called retain. It's a, in, it's a, in, 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 just, in, uh, yeah, please uh, go to the screen. The six R rules, it's don't uh, re resonate to the attacker, record what is happening by taking screenshots, uh, report uh, what you are facing either to Facebook, for example, directly, or for uh, any available reporting channel. Um, if the, the person is a friend, uh, so it's recommended to remove this person from the front list in order to avoid being contacted with other people. Uh, and also uh, restrain and reach out for a support. So these this simple tips for people to, to, to do when they are experiencing uh, any type of cyber, cyber violation. Uh, and also it's important to, uh, to raise the knowledge about digital security. For example, how people can build up their um, the password to avoid any data uh, stolen or uh, to avoid the stalking, especially for people who are working on um, activism or uh, journalism. Uh, so it's important to think about what they are sharing online and the, the pros and cons of sharing this information. Um, and also, um, what else? Okay, so these are these are the, the, the online um, recommendations that are very important. How do you link them with your offline work? So do you only share this online, or do you, do you also have activities oh, that yeah. need to bridge the gap between yeah. virtual yeah. and... Yeah, when we link this to on, really? the, uh, on the ground work, we, we combine the information to the, the offline training we, we offer for people. So it's important not to address gender-based violence offline, but also to address different forms of it online, and what people can do to protect themselves from this uh, this violence. Uh, and also, we, we start for, for example, the digital um, security part. This is a big topic. We try to, um, to simplify the information um, by collaboration with other NGOs and uh, digital security activists who are already specialized in this topic. And then they started doing the, like infographs and uh, short videos to simplify the information for people uh, to, to think about their privacy first and then how they can protect themselves and others from experience. Uh, and also, it's important <clears throat> we, we thought about this, uh, school students because they are heavily using the uh, internet. Um, so, for example, UNICEF, uh, they uh, you know, uh, prepared a great module on how people can deal with cyberbullying for parents, for teachers, for, for children themselves. So it's, it's important to use this information during our activities because it's it's waste of time to start building uh, new content. So it's better to use what is available right now. Thank you, Ines. And uh, you were talking about um, different actors uh, and their activities uh, 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 pushing for a, a similar objective. Um, I will go to Sonia and I will ask you a similar question about different actors, but this is under the same umbrella of feminism. And this excellent question comes from Renta as well. Um, how do you reconcile um, uh, the differences between, let's say, older feminists and younger? And here we're not necessarily talking about age, but just approaches to feminism. And I will link it with also another question that is excellent, which is um, 
younger uh, feminists tend to use more uh, digital approaches, but they can also be judged as useless. We're just resharing and upping. Um, so uh, how do you reconcile both um, and how can, uh, how can they both uh, push for common cause, which is a safer life um, for everyone? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to work both, um, let's say, on the virtual world and in the real world. So that's where, what we were doing with Enazida, it's on the virtual world, obviously. But uh, as what Nisi is, uh, first miss mission is advocating for, uh, for gender sensitive public policies and uh, fighting all forms of gender discrimination. So we work a lot on uh, public policies. We're monitoring uh, the, uh, the parliament's work and we also monitored uh, uh, the the implementation of law 58 combating violence against women uh, so we were we for example, for Law 58, uh, we did a lot of uh, access to information requests uh, to, to several uh, ministries in order to know what was going on, whether it is uh, on the budget or uh, for the implementation of, uh, of that law, basically. So it's very important for, for us to be on the ground, but also uh, in, uh, on, on social media, because let, we cannot, I mean, it's, social media is, is actually a very uh, impressive and powerful tool right now and uh, it can be a doubled aged let's say tool and sword here because um, we have cyber harassment I mean um, social media can lead to cyber harassment and most of the testimonies that we received on Enazeda come from uh, come from victims of cyber harassment so we also need to use social media in order to uh, spread awareness, as I was saying before, uh, about uh, that law that not a lot of people know of and uh, victims do not know what they can do when they are uh, basically um, subject to, uh, to violence. So it's very important to have that tool and also to be working on, uh, on, the, in the, real, on the ground uh, by, with, advocate, uh, with advocacy and, and have, having trainings for example uh, because we worked a lot um, with uh, with the communes so on on local public policies and uh, people from municipal councils for example uh, municipal councils in Beja uh, in the north of the country and uh, Mednin in the south of the country so uh, we worked with the municipal councils in order to in order to uh, let them know more about law 58 also but also to uh, to explain to them their roles as um, I, I mean as uh, as a municipal council how they can uh, fight uh, and combat violence against women. And that's what uh, we also try to do with, with our project there in, in Mednin. We actually uh, decided to, with the commune of Mednin, uh, in partnership with them, to, to, uh, to rename a street there. Uh, we called it a Street of Law 58. So in, in reference to, to the law, and we kind of have frescoes all over the all over that um, that the, the 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 wall of the street, and uh, we also that's the goal behind that is to kind of raise awareness again, but also we uh, we help the. Um, uh, the specialized unit there uh, with with equipments and we gifted them several things with with the commune of Menin in order to help them as much as we can on the ground. So we have advocacy, we have things like raising awareness on the ground and helping them, helping the specialized units and we also have the part on social media. So we have to be, I mean, we have to use every tool that we have basically. <laughs> Thank you, and this is one of them, which is bringing attention to, to the different um, um, experiences that exist, and hopefully um, the audience can can uh, be inspired from this. Um, I will do the last round, and I see that there are lots of questions uh, um, from uh, Renda and Nusra. I will try to to pose them, and this might be um, the final question that I uh, that I ask to each one of you, and you will each have three minutes. Um, it will be your ending remarks, but also in response to this question, if you'd like. Uh, it's more of a question of equality um, and marginalization. And it's um, and this is 
a specific question from Nusra, which is how to bridge the gap in digital inequality in conflict affected countries and make women and men contribute more to the digital women's rights discourse. It is a digital saloon, but I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is not everyone has access to digital tools. So how do you respond to that in your work moving forward? Um, um, and this will be your final remarks. So take advantage um, of your time. I will start again by you, Rida. Um, and then Ines, and then Sonia. Rita, the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, uh, Nusra, this is a, a, a very big and, uh, to be honest, a very existential even question because it's a, it's a long way, uh, really, if we want to, uh, like, really ensure uh, equality, let's say, in our community, in our real reality, at first, before even thinking and really reaching a point where we can talk about uh, equality in the in the digital uh, in the digital arena, because by the end of the day, if you want to think of all layers of patriarchy and all layers of gender uh, discrimination, even in in the notion of control over resources, uh, the ability, the time, like even the the freedom of uh, deciding on the use of your time, like the burden of the gender role that the the women have in their daily life, especially you nowadays in working, but also being the one in charge in the family and there is no unpaid care and especially I'm talking in the MENA region and in countries. Uh, adding to that, you have the control kind of because I'm the husband or I'm the father or whatsoever over your space and the freedom and there is this notion of hitting your cyber reputation by the same notion and the society which is the, the 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 question of honor and naming and shaming and so on and so forth uh, this is i think a long fight uh, uh, and especially in countries uh, affected by armed conflict uh, even if it's not the active direct one i would say lebanon nowadays we're living in a war uh, right it's not using the bombs and so on but i think it's one of the worst forms of war that ever citizens can can witness in your daily daily basic needs uh, and inability to access your work because of the inability to move because of lack of fuel, having bread, all of these. I just don't want to now uh, enumerate all of that, but thinking of the burden of the livelihood in addition to uh, public health problems, social norms, adding to it uh, how much we are trying to fight to, to, to be aligned with the um, uh, digital, let's say, uh, revolution, if I can say, we feel like we're very far behind yet from achieving first equality between humans and then gender equality and then talking about it in maybe in, in mediums where it can allow us just to fulfill and realize our rights and express ourselves and be protected without being without the fear that this is one additional layer where women and girls will be targeted or or all vulnerable groups uh, uh, if you just want to talk gender inequalities marginalized groups lgbt gr uh, community uh, refugees non-registered in certain countries and so on and so forth activists just trying to say the truth and being different all of these are the mostly attacked uh, so yeah I'm, I'm gonna stop there i think it's a it will it deserve a a webinar by itself uh, your question nusra honestly Absolutely, and I think, Rida, thank you for reminding us that uh, we're always at war, actually. It just takes uh, different forms, um, and it's a matter of definition. So thank you for that. Um, Ines, you, you have the liberty to respond to that question, too, but I see that Samar, um, who's also watching with us, has a specific question for you, if you'd like to ask. Um, she would like to know more about the case of Mawadda Adam and how legislation contributed in incriminating women online. If, that to, if that's something you're, uh, you'd like to talk about and maybe have your closing remarks uh, on that note. So the floor is yours for three minutes. Okay, uh, first I will um, answer the part specifically related to gender equality. When it comes to gender equality, according to the Egyptian society, we realize that it's important to start with many, despite all the effort is doing on the ground related to raising the awareness about gender equality, but it's there is a gap or there is a really need to to start working on raising the knowledge about what is gender, 
gender needs and gender responsibilities and the changing the gender norms. Because if we are doing activity without addressing these issues, there is no outcome of what we are doing. So for example, in our training, we started with the basic definition for what is the difference between sex and gender, gender responsibilities and gender roles, and then going to human rights, the basic human rights, to, to, to give the people think and, and understand the issue behind gender inequalities and what is the cause for this and the consequences for gender inequalities. Answering the question related to Mawad al-Adham, this example uh, shows what I was saying about alerting trends in cybersexual harassment. State targeting women online because of their presence online. So the case of Mawad al-Adham, she went to the jail with any unknown um, violation in the law, in the law, it's called any. Uh, the case was a violation of uh, Egyptian family rules, which is not which is not in the law. By the way, yani, we didn't hear this terminology before, but they use this to be an evidence or a tool to um, to minimize and restrain women from using internet and being present online. And Mawadal Adham, this is not the only case. There are other cases, for example, Hanin Hussain, she, she went to the jail for 10 years because she just posted videos on the TikTok. But the, yani, the state see this is not uh, suitable for the Egyptian families. Thank you, uh, Ines, for correcting my pronunciation of the name. It's important to know the names of the victims when, uh, when um, or the survivors when we know them because we bring life to them. They're not just another number or another figure or another story. They're real people with real lives. So thank you for that. Um, and I will end with, uh, with uh, Sonia. <laughs> We have our version of uh, family-appropriate things, which is Akhlaq al Hamida in Tunisia. So uh, yes. if you have something to talk about that, or if you have your, your own closing remarks, you are free. It's a free, safe space. Thank you. Thank you, Shaima. So I would like to stress the importance, once again, of, of, uh, of social media. For example, in Tunisia, we have over 5 million uh, Facebook users. So... As I was saying, it's a very powerful tool, but uh, with the number that we put in place, the, um, the system that we put in place, uh, we have, like I was saying before, we have a number uh, that people can call us on. Um, right now, even people who do not who do not have Facebook and who do not know of the the NSA movement are sharing that number. I mean, we receive calls or we receive messages from from uh, from people talking about uh, something that happened to to their mates, for example, or to a family member, or to to a cousin or a friend or whether whoever it is uh, that they know of and they want to help them. So here we 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 kind of notice the importance of, uh, of social media and we kind of need to work more on that uh, in that area but we also need to uh, need to let's say um, re remind ourselves here that during the quarantine social media was very important I mean it was basically the the only tool that we had and uh, the number of cyber of, uh, of um, cyber violence cases kind of blew up and the, the number of uh, uh, violence against women blew up in Tunisia as well and everywhere around the world so um, that tool was very important to us Thank you. Um, thank you, Sonia. Um, I, I'm, I'm very saddened, but the time is almost up and we still have a lot of questions. Um, I see that uh, some of our, um, our guests uh, are, are um, asking about the tools uh, regarding cybersecurity. So I will speak on behalf uh, or ask on behalf of the lead initiative uh, team, uh, Inez or Rida or, or Sonia, if you can if you can respond via via comments on on uh, on the event or later on, put the tools that you feel like uh, the audience uh, can can take more advantage of. At least we can give it more visibility and perhaps save lives and make them safer uh, around uh, the world. Um, 
it has come to an end. Uh, I would love to thank the audience first um, for their attention. Uh, many of the questions I know that were not posed because of time, but I do hope uh, that we can communicate them on our page, uh, lead the initiatives page, and uh, if the guests have the time and the interest, and I'm sure they do have the interest, they can kindly respond to them um, if they are specific. Again, it was an honor to be among uh, three powerful women, Rida Anani from Lebanon, Inas Hamdi from Egypt, and Sonia Bin Milad from Tunisia. The world feels safer just by having you rooting for a better life for everyone. This saloon will be made uh, available on Leeds Initiative's YouTube channel that will be created, created soon. Uh, it will be announced on the different social media platforms, so please stay tuned uh, for um, the video once it's available. The next digital saloon will also take place um, uh, sometime within the coming few months. Uh, the topic is, is, is quite um, heavy. It's how cultural, societal, and religious systems impact the work of women's rights defenders. Uh, and that also you will hear about on our social media um, platforms. Until then, if you have any feedback, any future questions that you'd like to pose or suggestions, I'm sure you can contact Lead Initiatives team on the different social media platforms. Until then, stay healthy, safe, and take care, um, and have an excellent day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.